morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. So we got to get busy and do it. Amen. Glad that you're here today. If you will, please draw your attention to the screens. We do have a couple announcements as we Trump start our time. will be again. Wednesday, October 31st from 6 to 7.30. All Wednesday night activities will be suspended for this annual event held on the Northwest parking lot. If you or your Bible Fellowship class is interested in hosting a trunk, please contact Jennifer Howington. A newly organized Mothers of Preschoolers and School Age Children, or MOPS group, will be meeting on a regular basis on the first, third, and fifth Mondays of each month from 10 a.m. to noon in the Children's Building Room 207. The next meeting is Monday, October 29th. Child care is provided. Please contact the church office for more information. Our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goal for international missions is $65,000. The in-gathering date is scheduled for Sunday, December the 9th. This offering supports international missionaries around the world. Be sure to stop by the Operation Christmas Child table in the Welcome Center. There you can pick up a box and fill it with toys for children in remote places around the globe. Completed boxes should be returned to the church by November 12th. Finally, on Friday, November the 9th, several Sunday school classes are putting together a night with Ray Hildebrand. I am Edie Hanna, co-teacher of the Mary Barton Ladies Bible Study Group at Phil Street. Our class is partnering with other Phil Street Bible Fellowship groups to invite you to be our guest at a free concert titled An Evening with Ray Hildebrand. Mark your calendars for November the 9th at 7 p.m. here at Phil Street and be a part of this memorable evening. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Hallelujah, church. What a savior. Let's all stand together as we sing this great old hymn. Hallelujah, hallelujah, what a saint.
Thank you. You may be seated. Would you please bow your heads and join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father, not to us, but to your name be the glory. We ask that you might meet our needs today. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Cleanse us of our sins and wrongdoing. Gently remind us of how great a Savior we have in Jesus. Thank you for the victory we have over sin and death through the person and work of your only begotten Son. May your Holy Spirit, in partnership with your inspired word, open our minds to the truths that are embedded in the scriptures about how we are saved. Remind us again of the foolish pursuit of attempting to save ourselves. By your grace, let our confidence always be in Christ alone. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is my joy to welcome you to worship today here at Field Street Baptist Church. If you are our guest today, we are thrilled that you have joined us for worship this morning. And we'd love to know that you are here. Whether you are a guest or a member of Field Street, would you please take a moment at some point during the service today and complete a communication card. That card is located in the pew in front of you. Take that card, complete it, and later when the offering plate is passed, drop that card inside the offering plate. We would delight in knowing of your presence here with us this morning. We are thrilled you are here. We're going to greet one another at the end of our service today. So just sit tight for a little bit longer, and then when the service concludes, we want to especially uh, greet one another and our guests in particular. Glad you're here this morning. Psalm 86, verse 12 says, I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever and ever.
Church, you know the words of Eugene Bartlett. We sang this song in the early service. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. You know that song? Oh, good. Okay, some folks are awake. Poke somebody next to you and just make sure. I'll wait and get some ushers here to check and see if we got a pulse. Are we all right this morning? The timeless message of the gospel is that we have victory in Jesus. But don't miss the fact that we can only experience this victory because Jesus is the victor. Amen. Let's sing this song together. He reigns forever. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him.
As you are being seated, let me ask you please to open your Bibles, your copy of the Word of God, to the New Testament book of Galatians. Our text this morning is found specifically in chapter 3, the opening verses of chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And I want us to think together this morning about the fallacy, the foolishness of performance-based Christianity. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul writes these words, and you need a pen or a pencil handy, and I want you to circle the word foolish in verse 1 and the word foolish in verse 3. Beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard. Have you ever done anything foolish? <laughs> Have you ever paused to consider some of the foolish things we do? The truth is that each and every one of us present in the room this morning, each of us has blind spots. Uh, we all find ourselves from time to time acting or thinking or speaking in a foolish manner. For instance, sometimes we just simply follow the wrong crowd. How many times have we been lured by our peers, by money, by the attractions of prestige or reputation to pursue a course of action we know simply to be unwise? How many times have we gone along to get along, even when we knew better in the moment? Secondly, sometimes, as you well know, our anger gets the very best of us. We blow up, and consequently, we damage a relationship or we make a bad decision in the heat of anger, and we let anger gain a foothold, and then the enemy can come along and use our outburst to lead us into sin. Sometimes we begin a bad habit Giving in once or twice to something makes it easier to repeat and repeat. Gambling, pornography, video game addiction, procrastinating, laziness, drinking, smoking, texting while driving, poor eating habits. You fill in the blank. Any of these kinds of habits can creep into our lives before we even realize what is happening. Bad habits of every kind tend to gain strength and become harder to break over time. So as we know, it is better to say no or walk away from these as early as possible. And then finally, sometimes we say yes to that which we should say no. This is especially true in the financial realm. We make decisions we haven't weighed carefully. If we can't pay for it, we probably shouldn't buy it. Too many people... Uh, live beyond their financial means. How many of us have experienced the old buyer's remorse? <laughs> Almost all of us have, have learned the hard way about unmanageable debt early in our adult lives, right? Well, the bottom line, of course, is that foolishness has found its way to all of our doorsteps. All of us could give testimony of some foolish thing we've done or foolish word we've said or some foolish thought we acted upon. We could all bear witness of this. In today's sermon text, Paul issues one of the strongest rebukes that we will find anywhere in all of his writings. He calls the Galatians, look at the word he says, he calls the Galatians foolish. He says, you foolish Galatians. And in a sense, Paul is coming apart at the seams. He is apoplectic, if you will. Uh, he, he is just beside himself regarding why the Galatians would turn from salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing else, to a performance-based brand of Christianity. Dear church, he is perplexed. He is shocked. He is confrontational. He is pointedly personal. 
Paul's outburst is completely understandable when you realize what is at stake. And what is at stake is the very core and heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, with this in mind, I want to put on your minds this morning three headings which will aid us in grasping the very essence of this text. In verse 1, first of all, I want you to see that performance-based Christianity is foolish. Secondly, in verse 3, I want you to see that performance-based Christianity is foolish. And then in verses 4 through 5, finally, I want you to see that performance-based Christianity is foolish. About four of you really paying attention that got that as we're moving along here. Look in verse 1 again. Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. What is going on with you people? Plain and simple, dear church, this is a rebuke of the highest order. Paul's language is pointed. It's personal. He is indignant. And the implication is this. Why should someone else... Jesus, have to die for your sins if you could take care of them yourself. The logical implication of justification by works is that, as is stated in verse 21, Christ died for no purpose. As far as Paul is concerned, the Galatians are guilty of just plain old spiritual stupidity. They were being foolish. In fact, the word for foolish here may also mean unintelligent, stupid, or without understanding. Yes, these are very harsh words, you foolish Galatians. They were clearly under the influence of these false heretical teachers. Paul is basically saying to the churches in Galatia, how can you believe this distortion of the truth? Who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? How can you be so deceived? Snap out of it, you foolish Galatians. Look no further than the cross of Christ, he says. The Galatians needed to fix again their gaze upon the cross of Jesus. Now that's a very interesting reference, is it not? The ancients thought that enchantment came through what was called the evil eye. Maybe you've received that from your spouse. The evil eye. Our children have been recipients of the evil eye. Sometimes during a church service. So it's interesting that Paul references this, is it not? Now that they were bewitched, the Galatians needed to fix their gaze, their vision again on the cross. And the very heart of Paul's preaching, as you well know, is Christ crucified. To preach is to portray the cross. And Paul preached what he called the word of the cross. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. Or Paul resolved in the scripture, according to 1 Corinthians 2, 2, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So make no mistake, let it ring loud and clear, dear church. Paul's gospel, our gospel, was the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. Furthermore, as commentator Philip Ryken astutely points out, Paul speaks of the crucifixion in the perfect tense. Now, I know you're sitting there going, well, I'm so glad I came to church today because I'm a big fan of grammar. <laughs> so tell me more about grammar. Now, literally, this means Jesus Christ was portrayed not as crucified, but as having been crucified. Now, you're sitting there, I know, <laughs> you're thinking... Why do I even care about this? Why does this matter? I'll tell you why it matters. Because the perfect tense in Greek grammar denotes a past event which continues to have significance in the present and in the future. It addresses all the spectrum of time, past, present, and future. Furthermore, it's so beautiful because this tense signifies action that is complete with permanent results. In other words, Jesus was crucified on a precise day by particular men outside a specific city on an actual tree. And on that day, Jesus gave his life as the once and for all perfect, complete, atoning sacrifice for our sin. 
Jesus paid the penalty for our sin once and for all. He never has to die again. And because he died in your place, you do not have to die as a result of your sin. It's no wonder then that Paul was beside himself. The Galatians were forgetting all of this. Performance-based Christianity is foolish because of Christ's all-sufficient death on the cross. But there's another idea that we have to lock down in our minds. Would you look again at verse 3? Paul says, are you so foolish? After, and this is very important, so underline this entire verse. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? After hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel and being saved by grace through faith in Christ, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Again, performance-based Christianity. Say it with me. It's just foolish. Look at verse 2. And see the rhetorical question Paul poses in verse 2. He says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? How do we then receive the Spirit, Paul says? By works? By faith. Of course, the biblical answer is by faith. And so it was for the Galatians. At least in the beginning, the Galatians could not deny their experience with the Holy Spirit. If they were Christians at all, as Paul assumes that they were, then they had received the Holy Spirit at the moment of their new birth, the moment of their conversion to Christ. And Paul wanted to know, how had the Galatians received the Holy Spirit? There were only two possibilities, Paul says, by observing the law or by believing what you heard. The implication is quite obvious. If the Spirit comes by keeping the law, then there is something that I must do to get the Spirit. If one keeps the Torah and follows the regulations of the Old Testament law, then God will give me His Spirit. Thus, the blessing of the Holy Spirit is God's reward to me for my spiritual achievements. Ah, and therein lies the reality of what people want. They want the means to guarantee themselves a good spiritual experience. Foolish, but commonplace. False gospels abound in the culture today. And I'll go as far as saying that false gospels abound right here in Cleburne, Texas. Allow me to make the case. Did you know the following? Did you know that the Roman Catholic Church, that's right, the Catholic Church teaches that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. How can this be? Did you know that the majority of Catholic priests deny the biblical doctrine of salvation because as priests whose loyalty lies with the Pope, they are required to reject the idea that divine authority resides only in the Bible. For them, divine authority rests in the Catholic Church and tradition and how they interpret the Bible. Catholic teaching holds that salvation, listen to this, is the lifelong process whereby God and mankind cooperate in the securing of forgiveness. This is achieved only after death and is dependent on man's personal securing of objective righteousness before God in this life. Otherwise, there is no salvation. And you have Catholic friends that believe this. Consider Mormonism for a moment. Again, note the personal performance-based emphasis. As a Christian, as a biblical follower of Jesus Christ, we teach... Not sure everyone believes it, but we teach that we will stand before God dressed in the robes of the spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ. Whereas 
Mormons contend that they will appear before the Heavenly Father dressed in fig leaf aprons holding good works in their hands. And according to the Latter-day Saints, virtually everyone qualifies for heaven, even the unrepentant. Furthermore, Mormonism places all of their scriptures above the Bible in authority and inspiration. And we all have friends, whether they admit it or not, who are Marxists. (laughs) Marxism contends that there is no God and that humanity can be saved from alienation by eliminating private property and class distinctions and that humanity's hope is not to be found in the Savior Jesus the Christ, but in political revolution. Islam advocates that the standard for salvation is having one's good deeds outweigh one's bad deeds. Therefore, it is based on performance on human effort. And then secular humanism teaches that people must save themselves. There are no moral absolutes and there is no God. You can discover truth by your own reason and logical thinking. You see, there is no bar of obedience. The only way to merit favor with God, according to the Bible is to put your trust, your faith, your confidence in Jesus Christ alone. Performance-based Christianity, it's a fallacy. There's no such thing. It's a fool's errand, and the Bible makes this crystal clear. The indwelling presence of His Spirit comes to us by faith alone, and Paul makes clear that justification and the Spirit come by faith. You do not gain the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to you by God and Christ His Son. One final idea. Look at verses 4 and 5 again. Paul says, Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and and, and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Verse 4 is is fascinating because... (laughs) It's really not connected to any previous thought or to any other thought elsewhere in the letter. Still, there could be no question that the Galatians, as well as all of us who turn to Christ for our salvation, that they experienced and we will experience some type of of suffering. Yet there is very little said in the book of Galatians specifically about the nature of their suffering. Which brings me to this. Other Bible scholars, some Bible scholars set forth that the opposite might be the case here, meaning that which precedes verse 4 might very well point to past favors, such as the public proclamation of the gospel to the Galatians, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the occurrence of miracles in their midst. William Hendrickson, I think he's right to set forth this idea as a very reasonable possibility. So in this sense, Paul may very well be asking, did you experience all of these things in Christ? Did you experience all these blessings in vain? That is, to no effect. Did you not profit from your spiritual experiences? And the Galatians' response obviously was errant. In verse 5, Paul returns to the question he asked previously. Did the blessings the Galatians had received, were they the result of obedience to the law or by faith in the Lord Jesus? And if it is the latter, and it most certainly is, then why are the Galatians turning away from faith to works? Why a performance-based brand of Christianity? It is utterly foolish to think you can merit faith, merit favor with God by what you do. I guarantee you there are people in the room this morning who think this. And you may not realize you're thinking it, but you need to be exposed in the sense of this is what the gospel teaches. Our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, plus nothing else. So please let me encourage you lovingly as your friend and pastor, don't add anything else to it. Don't do that. 
Why? Because Paul would say, that is foolish. He would say, you foolish Clebronites. You foolish field streeters. I don't know exactly what he'd come up with, but I know he would say, you're being foolish. Performance-based Christianity, there's no such thing. There's performance-based Mormonism, performance-based Roman Catholicism, performance-based Islam, but there is no performance-based Christianity. We have to get out of that thinking. And it is then and only then that you can be truly free to know that you have the favor of God because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. But we're all striving. I, I do it too sometimes. Oh, if I just go and talk to that person, I bet I get a check mark with God. It just doesn't work that way. You know what? If you're in Christ, you already have favor with God. How did that happen? Because Christ, God took the righteousness of Christ and gave it to you. And he took all of our mess and gave it to Christ. And Christ died for that and wiped out and paid our sin debt. Furthermore, the Bible teaches, and we'll see this in Galatians in a few weeks, that you are adopted into the family of God. Did you know that if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, that you are a child of God? But the only way you become a child of God is to be adopted into His family. Well, that's such a great concept in the Scripture, that God chooses to adopt us, whereby we are joint heirs with Jesus and we are children of God. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. And how you got that way was not because of anything you did. It was because of everything Christ did. And when you believe in Him and you put your confidence in Him and your trust in Him alone to be saved, God gives you the Spirit. He forgives you and He gives you Christ and the righteousness of His Son. Cease striving to do so is foolish. Would you bow your head with me, please? Father, thank you for ordering our steps to come to the church house today, to gather with your people and to gather around this magnificent text of Scripture. I suppose if I was in the church, one of the churches in the Galatian region, when this letter was read, I would have fallen under deep conviction, for I too am guilty of trying to add to my salvation thinking that somehow I have to merit favor with you. I have, to, I have to do just enough so that you'll think well of me when the truth is you already think well of me because I'm your adopted son. So forgive me, please, for being so foolish. I pray, Father, that I would no longer, that we would no longer be bewitched by all the false gospels that float around us every day, by everything that we're exposed to, a deception here, a deception there, and then before we realize it, we've drifted away from the truth that should anchor us to know that our salvation is of you alone and that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ plus nothing else. And because of our salvation in and through Christ, we are your children and therefore we have favor with you. So let the fruitfulness of our lives, the works of our lives be evidences of our being born again, being regenerated by the Holy Spirit, of being in Christ. How did we come to have the Spirit? Was it by works or by believing? And of course, the answer in Scripture is by believing in the name of Christ. Encourage us, and strengthen us. That we may understand what we believe and why. We pray that you'll have your way with each of us this morning as we respond. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And it's simply a time for you to respond in some way to how the Spirit of God has spoken to you over the course of this worship hour. 
our great prayer is that if you are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, that these moments would be those of salvation where you repent of your sin and by faith trust Christ alone to be your Savior and begin walking in fellowship with Him. One of the worst uh, lies we've been sold is that somehow we have to add something to what God has done for us in and through Christ. And a lot of people we know are just hoping to get into heaven and they believe exactly what a Muslim believes. I hope my good outweighs my bad and God will accept me. I'll tell you right now that God will accept you completely based on what Christ did for you. On that precise day in a specific city on an old rugged cross where he took your place and mine and spilled his blood on your behalf. And if you will trust him to be your savior, you will be saved and you will be forgiven and you will be given the righteousness of Christ and you'll never have to wonder again, will God accept me? Of course he will. You are his, adopted into his family by faith in Jesus Christ. No wonder the gospel is so magnificent. And no wonder we must preach it faithfully to the glory of God. Maybe you'd come uniting with our church this morning, placing your membership here in, at Field Street. I don't know what you need to do. These moments are for you and between you and the Spirit of God. Would you please stand to your feet as we extend this invitation? I'll be standing here at the front to receive any that might feel a need to come publicly this morning. You come as we sing. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Thank you. Please be seated for just a few moments more. Our ushers are coming forward as we prepare to receive this morning's offering. Inside your worship guide today, there are numerous printed announcements. Our effort is to keep you informed so that you might uh, be involved in all that God is doing in and through the life of our church. So please uh, take the time uh, to read uh, the printed information that's before you this morning. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day, the day you have given us, and we are glad and we rejoice in it. Uh, thank you for the sunshine that we haven't seen in a while. While we're grateful for the rain, it's sure good to see the sunshine. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, thank you that the sun uh, always rises. We're grateful, Lord, for your grace and goodness and faithfulness to us in all things. As we give back to you this morning through the offering, I pray, Father, we would give with grateful and cheerful hearts out of gratitude for all you have done for us in Christ. And I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name.
Have y'all heard of the two-minute warning? Anybody watch American football? And you've heard of the two-minute warning. It's probably when you get up and go get a snack or a drink or whatever. Uh, in the church, we're going to call it the two-minute drill. And uh, after I close in prayer for the next two minutes after I say amen, I'm going to ask all of our Field Street people to postpone visiting with one another for two minutes, and let's greet our guests and we're let them know how grateful we are that they're here with us today. Now, we don't want to scare and overwhelm and make our guests feel awkward. Coming at you like an angry mob, that's not how we want to do it. We just want you to know how much we appreciate that you would join us uh, for worship today and give us an opportunity uh, to get to know you for just two minutes. And then after you've done the two-minute drill, of course, visit uh, among yourselves. We're grateful for the fellowship we enjoy in our church. Would you please rise to your feet as we have a closing prayer and then practice the two-minute drill. Let's pray. Thank you for a very good day in your house, dear Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. Thank you for what you have done for us through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that we will go encouraged that we are your children, adopted into your family. Thank you for this grace gift. Thank you for the grace that has saved us and the grace that sustains us. Help us to live our lives for your glory. Thank you, especially today, for those who have joined us, who are guests with us this morning. We're grateful to welcome them. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Amen.